Okay, so I'm going to take you through the math derivation that allows you to come up with the formulas that help us understand what happens to length or distance and what happens to time. Those are our two tasks for today. Okay, it's just Pythagorean triangles. Follow along. I'm never going to ask you to derive this. I just want you to see where it comes from and see that the math is not that complicated. Okay, so here we go. Uh, remember that delta x equals v times delta t, right? That was first semester stuff. So distance is velocity times time. All right, now we're going to be talking about two different light clocks, we call them. It's a clock that's moving. This one on the bottom is moving from left to right, and the one here is standing still. And they're going to send a little, a, a little pulse of light that's going to go up to the top and then come back down again. Up to the top and come back down again. Okay, two different scenarios. One standing still, and then one is moving. And we're going to look at the math of what happens. So two light clocks, one moving, and one is moving at speed. One is moving at speed v, and the other one is moving, or is at rest. Okay. Because both light pulses move at the speed of light, but moving one, the, the moving one has further to go, the time must slow down for the moving clock. Okay, that's the whole premise of this. The time is going to slow down for the moving clock because the light pulses go at the same speed, but one has farther to go. So let's figure out exactly, mathematically, what that means. Okay, so what we have here, we have C delta T. This is... The distance, remember, the distance is velocity times time, right? This is going to be the distance that it goes on its way up on the moving clock. And this is how far the, the, uh, the, tr the clock itself has moved, V delta T. And then this is the, the distance it will have gone for the stationary clock. Okay, so C delta T zero. Delta C zero is the time it takes if it's not moving. Okay, so the T represents the time it takes if it is moving, and the T0 takes, stands for the time if it's not moving. Okay, uh, T time to go while moving. Okay, that looks good. All right, so keep going. V is how fast it's going. And so now we're going to do a little Pythagorean triangle. Okay, we have a right triangle right here. We say V delta T squared plus C delta T zero squared equals C delta T squared. And I just drop the deltas because it's simpler to write it. Okay, so Pythagorean triangle. And now we're just going to simplify and do some algebra. You guys are good at this stuff. Uh, so I'm going to solve for C T sub 0 squared. I'm going to isolate the T sub 0 by itself. Um, and then I get C T squared minus V T squared. I pull out the T squared. I get C squared minus V squared. C squared over here, T sub 0 squared. I'm going to solve for T sub 0 squared by dividing by C squared. Uh, actually, I moved it to the other side. I'm solving for T squared instead of T sub 0 squared. And then I divide by C squared. I'm doing more algebra, algebra, algebra. And finally, almost there, I take the square root. And this is what I get. Ta-da. Okay, so here's the equation. T equals T sub 0 over 1 minus the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. Okay, this little uh, 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared, we use that so frequently in relativity type of discussions that it gets its own little Greek letter. Greek letter. We call that letter gamma. Uh, so we'll talk about that in the next slide. Okay, so here we go. This describes what happens with time. So time slows down. Compared to clocks at rest, clocks that are moving tick slower. More time will have elapsed for an observer at rest than for the observer in motion. Okay, so gamma. Here's gamma. 1 over gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over, t over c squared. So if you just see it written, t equals gamma times t sub 0, just plug in this little formula, okay? Uh, t sub 0 stands for proper time. That means time that you would uh, calculate if you're not moving, okay? And then t represents the time that gets elongated, okay? It gets, the clock goes slower, so it takes more time. So you need to make sure you, like T0 is normal time. Think about that. Yes? What does it mean like the clock moves slower? Like time actually moves slower? Yeah. So, so what it means is, let's say I'm on Earth and you are in a rocket ship going really fast. Okay? And, um, and somehow we agree, like we wave at each other. In fact, your problem has one thing where you wave at each other. We'll talk about it in here one in just a second. We wave at each other. And so when we wave at each other, like you're going to wave at me, and then you wave at me again after a few seconds. 
Okay, so that's, that's what's going to happen. And I'm going to see you. So we both start our clocks. When you first wave at me, I start my stopwatch. And then you wave at me again. Okay, so let's say, let's say it was four. I, I count uh, between your waves. Let's see, you count, you know, you're in the ship and you go start 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. Okay, so you count four seconds and you, you feel like you're stationary and you think I'm moving really fast. Does that make sense? So you count four seconds. But... I count five seconds because from your perspective, you're stationary and I'm moving, my time goes slower. Okay, it is really hard to wrap your head around. We'll do some of the math and you're just going to have to keep working at it. But that's the idea, is that when you're standing still, your clock moves at one rate, but relative to you, somebody who's moving, their clock runs slower. Okay, so let's take a look at the math here and you can see what's going on. So for example... Uh, what if, uh, what is gamma going to be if you are moving at half the speed of light? Okay, so that's really, really fast. Okay, so that's 1.5 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We often do solve these problems in terms of C, and then the C's cancel out, right? So it's 0.5 C or 0.1 C or 0.6 C. The C's cancel out, so that makes it really nice. Um, we don't usually do it in 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second because then that's just a lot of exponents and square roots, and it's complicated. So uh, what, do you, what is gamma going to be if... In other words, what's that factor that's going to increase the time if you're going at half the speed of light? So you'd say, okay, well, that's going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus uh, v squared, which is 0.5c, right? 0.5c, that's how fast you're going. Their speed is 0.5c, quantity squared, divided by c squared, which is 1 minus 0.25, because the c's cancel. So 0.5 squared is 0.25, 1 minus 0.25 is 0.75. When you take one over the square root of one minus, uh, I'm sorry, square root, square root of one over 0.75, you get 1.15. So what does that mean? That means two seconds to me. If I'm experiencing two seconds on Earth, that means that if I see something going by at half the speed of light, their clock to me appears to be running two times 1.15. I have to multiply by that factor to get the longer time. Okay? So, let's do a problem. If observer Bill, who is on a train moving with the speed 0.6c, waves to Julie at four second intervals as measured in Bill's frame, how long will Julie measure between waves? Okay, this is a typical type of relativity problem that you're going to be expected to be able to solve. I've left the formulas up here for you. Okay? So, let's figure out what we know. What has been given? Let's extract what's been given from this problem. Observe Bill, who's on a train moving with speed 0.6c. What does 0.6c represent? V. Good. It's our V. First of all, I'm drawing a little picture. Every physics problem should have a picture. There's Bill on the train going really fast at 0.6c. And here's Julie watching. Okay, so V is uh, 0.6c. Now, she waves to Julie at four second intervals as measured in Bill's frame. So Bill is in the train and he's waving. He starts at stoplight. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4. Okay, so T sub 0, that's his time. Four seconds. And the question is, what is the time that Julie will measure between the waves? Okay, so T is equal to gamma times T sub 0. So T sub 0 is 4. 4 seconds, divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.6c squared over c squared. The c's cancel. We crank it out. Square root of 1 minus 0.6 squared. 1 minus 0.36, which is 0.64, which is the square root of that is 0.8, which is 5 seconds. Okay? So, Bill, on his train is moving along, and he starts his stopwatch and stops it after four seconds. Julie, who is watching him do that, thinks that it is five seconds between start and stop of his watch. Okay, now here's the weird thing about this. What if Julie, what if instead of having Bill being the one that started and stopped the stopwatch, what if Julie started and stopped the stopwatch, as Bill was going by, what would Bill observe? Okay, so Julie goes, start, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. And Bill goes flying by. What does he think 
the elapsed time that Julie has experienced is? Yeah, David? Five seconds. Five seconds. So that's what's really weird about this, is like, he thinks that my time slows down because I'm moving fast relative to him. And I think his time slows down because he's moving fast relative to me. Okay? Explain that one to your parents when you go home. That'll get them for sure. Okay. Yes? Do you think the moving person's time moves faster, but it really moves slower? No, you don't think... The, you, the, the person who's moving clocks run slower as the way you observe. And they tested this. So in the 1970s, they took an atomic clock. An atomic clock was like one that had a radioactive decay. And so it was a very fixed rate. Like they knew how much radioactive material they had. And they knew like if you were to fly this plane around the world, it should have, you know half of whatever that radioactive material left. Like, that's how much should have decayed in the time where it traveled. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's an atomic clock. It's incredibly precise. And they took an atomic clock, and they put it on an airplane, and they flew it around as high a speed as they could, and then they compared, and they said, okay, so how much material is left? If, if they had the same exact clock here on Earth, then they'd say then half the material would be there. But what they found is that after the thing flew around, there was more than half. In other words, not that much had decayed because the time had slowed down for that device. And it was obviously a very, very small amount, but it was measurable, and they could prove it, right? So, um, okay, another classic kind of experiment is what they call the muon experiment. And I've linked to it here if you guys want to check it out. There's a nice link on um, hyperphysics. Um, and here's the idea. Muons are little particles, and they're... they're um, they, they have a radioactive kind of half-life. So they don't last very long. In fact, they last very, very short periods of time. But they are bombarding us from space at really high rates. Okay, so if you were to go up to um, 30,000 feet in an airplane and measure, because um, you can detect these things, the rate or the density of flow of muons coming down from the space, right? So, so here's, here's the idea. You have all these muons... You have all these muons, so here's the ground, and here's 30,000 feet, and you have, too bad for the recording, I'm just going to pause it. Pause. Pause. So two things happen from this relativistic effect. Time slows down, also length contracts, so distances get smaller. So if you're the muon, if you're the muon and you're falling through the atmosphere, what you see is the earth coming at you really, really fast. You're just standing still, right? You're not accelerating. You're just following it at a constant speed. But the Earth is coming at you really, really fast. Because the Earth is moving at you so fast, the distance between you and the Earth contracts. It shrinks. So your clock is running at the same rate that it normally would, but that distance that you're falling just got really, really small. And so you make it. You make it to the Earth without collapsing or decaying. Yeah. Right. What is that? You can't do it. It's not possible. Okay? You cannot move at the speed of light. It is impossible. It what breaks all the rules. What? They don't have time dilation. Like you know, moving at sea. Okay, so yeah, I could say something with mass. Something with mass that's that's, that's wouldn't be what's faggy. Yeah, so photons are gonna go at the speed of light, waves are gonna go at the speed of light, but matter. Once you, they, they can't go to the light. We have, an, we have a momentum problem. We have an energy problem. We'll talk about those guys coming up. Um, uh, which you just reminded me of something, though. I was going to say something else, and I forgot it. So maybe I'll come back to Oh, I know what I was going to show you. I was going to show you this. Um, let's, let's look at this formula a second. Okay, okay guys, so I'll do it on here so they can see it. Um, so remember this formula right here, this, this square root of, what was it? Um, what was it? Uh, 1 minus v squared over c squared, right? What happens when the speed is really slow compared to the speed of light? Like in our normal light, it's like a car that goes 50 miles an hour. That seems really fast to us, right? But it's nothing compared to the speed of light. What happens when V is very, very small, mathematically speaking? Well, this basically cancels out. It becomes like zero over C because C is so big that that term kind of cancels out, right? And then you get the square root of one. 
Does that make sense? So, so basically your t is equal to t sub zero. So there isn't any change in time because the, slow, the speed isn't fast enough. The only time this effect is going to come into play is when v gets close to the speed of light. Okay, let's look at another problem. Length contraction. For an object moving relative to a rest frame, its length will contract. For an object moving relative to a rest frame, its length will contract. The distance will get shorter. So if this is the size of a rocket ship at 0 C, then this would be the size of the rocket ship at 0.86 C, 0.995, 0.99995. It gets really, really, really small. Okay? And, and it's only in one dimension, though, right? So the width doesn't change. It's just the length in the direction of motion. The rocket's going this way. It's going to contract in its direction of motion only. It won't contract in the other dimensions. Um, so a meter stick moving near the speed of light will appear shorter. Okay? Now that's the opposite of what happened with the time. Time got longer. The time got bigger, right? But the length is going to get smaller. In order for that to happen, you're going to have your gamma in the denominator. So we had the gamma up above for, um, for time. It was t equals gamma t sub zero. For length, it's L sub zero over gamma. Yes, Casey. It would seem small compared to someone observing. But on the ship, it would, on the ship it would feel totally normal. But let's say you're on a rocket ship and you're going really fast and you were, you know, I don't know, out at Mars and you wanted to come to Earth, right? If you were traveling really fast, then that distance between the Mars and Earth would get much smaller because it would be as if the Earth were coming to you really quickly. So that length would contract. It feels so much smaller. It, 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 it's not feel. It, it would be smaller. It would take you less time to get there because that distance would get shorter. Yeah, but. Like from the observer's point of view, it's all about perception. Right? Uh, it depends on where you are to consider what exactly is happening. Okay. So it does, it does, it's not about perception. It really is happening, but it does depend on what is your point of view. Like my perception, if I'm on Earth with a rocket ship that Casey's on coming towards me, you know, I see his time slowing down. I see the length contracting, but he's going to see the length contracting also, um, but he's going to see my time slowing down. So it's confusing. All right, here we go. Let's try a problem. Bill and Julie are both now on identical trains. Bill's train is moving to the right with a velocity of the square root of 3 over 2 c with respect to Julie's train. Julie measures her train to be 100 meters long. How long does Julie b measure Bill's train to be? How long does Bill measure Julie's train to be? Okay, so here we go. What do you think L sub 0 is? That's the original length, which would be 100 meters, okay? And the velocity is square root of 3 over 2c. Okay, so you guys go ahead and write this one down and try to work it out, okay? Kind of do it with me. V is the square root of 3 over 2c. L sub 0 is 100 meters. We're trying to find what is L. Because gamma is 1 over something, then 1 over gamma means just take the radical and put it out in front of the L. That's all you have to do. Gamma is a fraction, so 1 over gamma gets rid of the fraction part. Okay, so square root of 3 over 2c squared, what, what do you get when you square that? Square root of 3 over 2 squared. is 3 fourths, 1 minus the square root of 1 quarter, 50 meters. So by traveling at 0.866 times the speed of light, you've just caused the length of that train to be, to perceive, you would perceive the length of that train to be half of what it normally would be. The length is getting smaller. So that's what Julie measures Bill's train to be. How long does Bill measure Julie's train to be? What do you think? 50 meters. What's the difference? Okay. In the first case, Julie is measuring Bill's train. So Julie is standing still, and Bill's train goes flying by. 
the length, the distance of the length of that train is going to contract for her because she's standing still and she sees the train go by. But then Bill, who is on the train moving really fast, he feels himself moving really, just standing still, and he sees her flying by the other direction. So for him, his train is 100 meters, but hers is going super fast, so he sees hers as being 50 meters. Okay, uh, a new measurement of distance. I'm sure you've heard this before, but let's just review it. A light year. A light year is not a time, it is a distance. Okay? A light year is a distance that light travels in one year. So, C is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and then you multiply it by the number of seconds in a year, and you get an answer in meters. Okay, now, last little concept, mathematical. In classical physics, we have a scenario where Matt is sitting here, and I'm on a train, and I throw a baseball. Okay? The relativistic feed s speed says, if I'm going you know, 50 miles an hour, and I throw a 90 mile an hour pitch, then relative to Matt, the speed of the pitch relative to him is 140, right? The 50 of the train plus the 90 of the pitch, 140. Add them together, okay? But what if I am on a train moving half the speed of light and I throw a pitch at half the speed of light? Then what is the new speed of the pitch relative to Matt? It's a different calculation. You have to include relativistic effects. And here is the equation, okay? So what that's saying is, So over here, u represents the velocity that it seems like to you, okay? Um, v is how fast the train is moving. u prime is how fast you throw the pitch, okay? So you have to include in this denominator down here the relativistic effect. So instead of just being v plus u prime, you have this fractional value down below. Now let's think about what happens what happens to this fractional value if you're not moving very fast? Like if you're not moving very fast, if this number is really small compared to c, this is c squared, so that's a really, really big number. What if you're only moving 140 miles an hour? It's essentially zero. And so you get zero over c squared, right? And so that term becomes zero, and this becomes one. And look, it, comes, it just ends up looking like the classical physics equation. Whenever you're going to come up with some sort of a generalistic explanation, it better fit for the, 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 um, the cases that you are also familiar with. So it works for relativistic speeds, close to the speed of light, and it works for slow speeds because it, the, the factor just drops out. You don't care about it. Okay, so um, this is how you calculate when you are moving fast and you launch something that's moving fast. What is its actual speed going to appear to be to you? Okay, so here we go. A train moving at 0.4 C fires a watermelon cannon where the watermelon travels at 0.3 C with respect to the ground if it were standing still. Find the total speed of the watermelon with respect to the ground. Okay, if this were a classical physics situation, what would the speed of the watermelon be with respect to the ground? 0.7. You just take the 0.4 plus the 0.3, add them together, no big deal. But because we're going really, really fast, we have to include relativistic effects. So we're going to say our new speed is the speed of the train, 0.4c, plus 0.3c, how fast the pitch is, okay? Uh, over 1 plus 0.4 times 0.3c, the c's, c's are going to cancel, and then you solve. And so I'm working it out in my super fast writing. The C's cancel. Okay, so I get 0.63C. What was the classical answer again? 0.7. So it's close, but definitely less, for sure. 
the closer you get to C, the bigger the difference you're going to see between the classical solution and the relativistic solution. Okay, a couple concept questions. The special theory of relativity deals with measurements made in different reference frames that A, are moving at constant velocity relative to each other, B, are accelerating relative to each other, C, are at rest relative to each other. And the answer is? A, are moving at constant velocity relative to each other. Okay, good. Uh, next, if a rocket moves away from you at point 0.9c and a light beam is sent out the back of the rocket towards you, the speed of the light beam as you measure it is... Talk with your neighbor. It's a trick question. The answer is C. You're always going to measure the speed of light to be C, no matter what. No matter what train speeds are moving, you're always going to measure the speed of light to be C. Okay, two events have the same time at different positions in your reference frame. In a reference frame moving by you, the two events, A, occur at the same time. B, occur at different times. C, don't occur at all. And general agreement. The answer is B. Very good. Okay. Compared to a clock at rest relative to you, a clock moving by you will run as measured by you. And the answer is, eh, pretty much, most of you guys got it. Slow. The clock will run slow. In other words, time will take longer. It's like the battery's not working in the clock, except it is working. Okay. Compared to a meter stick at rest relative to you, a meter stick that is moving by you will be measured to be... Everybody got that one. Shorter. Yeah, time is a little weirder to think about, but length is pretty straightforward. A rocket ship moving by you at point 0.9c fires a missile forward at point 0.8c relative to the rocket. The speed of the missile, as measured by you, will be... Less than C, more than C, C, and zero. Zoe, you voted? Still thinking? Okay, I can see it now. Yeah, you guys got it. The answer is less than C. Okay? This is different from the other one, right? Because this is actually an object. A missile has mass. Right? Light, it's going to go at the speed of light. But anything that has mass is not going to go at the speed of light. It's going to go less than the speed of light. Nothing can go more than, nothing can go more than the speed of light, and nothing can even go at the speed of light if it has mass. Okay. And that is it.